COVID-19, as hospitals worldwide wage war on the coronavirus, a different viral battle rages in cyberspace. The disinformation is bewildering. You're not able to verify all the information that you've got. Twitter alone has over half a billion posts about COVID-19 since the beginning of the year. Many of them are dangerously misleading. Empty. Everywhere is empty. In our hyper-connected world, the online chatter ignites fear and confusion. You hold your teacher because somebody will I can it you. You. It also rallies people together for the greater good. It's so touching. In this documentary, we explore how the viral spread of information is changing our fight against this disease. This is the social media pandemic. Tenth of January, 2020. China's annual mass migration begins. Every year, hundreds of millions return to their hometown for the Lunar New Year. But this year, a hidden passenger is hitching a ride. The world's largest movement of people is about to exacerbate a disease outbreak. The 1st of January, 2020. As the world ushered in the new year, authorities were closing down a seafood market in Wuhan, China. 27 people, most of them linked to the Wanan seafood market, have fallen ill from a mysterious virus. At first, it was thought that the virus jumped from wild animals sold here to humans. But on the 20th of January, with infections rising rapidly in Wuhan, Chinese health authorities finally confirm human-to-human -human transmission. It triggers public concern about what scientists identify as a new coronavirus. Data on China's largest social media platform, WeChat, records a sudden surge in the usage of the Chinese term for coronavirus, with more than 200 million mentions. Within a week, the number of confirmed cases jumped from 41 to nearly 600. Not just in Wuhan, but across China and abroad. The epicenter of the outbreak, Wuhan, comes under lockdown. With the world's news crews locked out of Wuhan, Chinese netizens like filmmaker Lan Bo give a glimpse of life inside. The once bustling boom town of 11 million people is reduced to a ghost town. But inside Wuhan City's hospitals, a very different story is playing out. With existing health facilities unable to cope, China races to build two new hospitals in record time. In an unprecedented move to inspire public confidence, state-owned broadcaster CCTV live streams the construction. Tens of millions tune in. And the hospitals are completed in 10 days. The first one to open is the Ho Shen Shan Hospital. Hello, I'm the first 
刚来的时候，壳都不带停的，喘的也很厉害。Wan Chun Wei's viral video blogs give the world a rare glimpse inside the hospital. Hello, everyone. I just got a bottle of blood from the hospital today. I'm going to get a blood test for the hospital. The doctor of the hospital is really good. He's been here all day, giving a hospital visit. They're all going to die after death. Wan's social media account swells to hundreds of thousands of followers, all curious to know how he's doing. This is the Wan Shan Wan Cai. 真的是非常的好吃、啊。But outside the hospital, the lockdown slows essential supplies into the city. Across China, netizens organize grassroots movements to send fresh food into Wuhan. Sichuan Province is over 1,000 kilometers away from the virus epicenter. Hello, 大家好，我是大树。And it's here that a vegetable farmer takes to social media for the biggest call out of his life. Panda Xu uses social media to call for help to harvest his crops and transport them into the embattled city. His video gathers more than four million views. And across China, people swing into action. The Xu eventually fills up eight trucks provided by netizens who responded to his call. But he now has another problem. With Wuhan under strict lockdown, will his trucks be allowed in without any form of authorization? His live stream followers watch as he hits one roadblock after another. By this point in early February, Wuhan along with much of Hubei province, has been in lockdown for two weeks. But the virus is one step ahead. Over 9,000 cases, or nearly a third of the total cases, are found outside of the province. Anhui is among the five provinces with the most cases outside of Hubei. In this rural part of Anhui, Many migrant workers who work in Wuhan have returned for the Lunar New Year. But there's a growing fear they brought the virus with them. To contain its spread, local officials like Wei Chan Sun serve as gatekeepers to enforce travel restrictions. Outsiders are not allowed to enter and locals need a permit to exit. 
，就设立了一清风控卡点。我负责两个村，两个村有一万人，我在为一万人在战斗。Unable to go home since the Lunar New Year, Wei keeps his family updated by posting pictures and videos on his social media page. Benson 对这个病情的这个严重性，理解的不够透彻。喂，家里面吃的可有了？可不，我不冷。啊，吃的有啊。嗯，够吃的呗。都够吃的，家里面什么都有。啥时回来？Wei hasn't been home for weeks, and doesn't expect to until the virus is contained. 我和我们同事们都一样，都疫情工作开展以来都没回家，就防止我们还是存在一定的风险，并不是一点风险没有，存在一定的风险。然后，嗯，恐怕就是别有什么事，别。影响到家人的健康。对对，有一次，家里没有没有没有菜吃了，没有菜吃了，因为小区那边是封闭式管理嘛，没有菜吃了。我就在乡下，乡下买点蔬菜，那个往家送送一次，送一次到楼下我也没上楼，也没有跟家人见个面。嗯，想念肯定是想念的。Back in Sichuan, vegetable farmer Da Xu has been trying for days to contact Wuhan officials to allow him to transport truckloads of vegetables to the city under lockdown. He appeals to his followers for help, and it works. Within days, netizens help him reach out to officials for travel permits. Da Xu sends a total of 75 tons of fresh vegetables into Wuhan. Mission accomplished. I remember when I came to you, you should have seen me. I was pretty strong. I was still not able to cry. Especially for me, who have been out of the door, who have been back, I feel that this disease is so dangerous. After nearly three weeks in Huo Shenshan Hospital, Wan is finally discharged. I got out. I got out. This is my doctor. I'm the doctor. 给大家打个招呼，嗨。But Wan is walking out to a vastly different world. Despite the lockdown in China, COVID-19 continues to spread. It moves silently across borders, conquering new lands. But spreading faster than the sickness. Is something equally insidious. They created this race. A new wave of fear and discrimination. From China. 
COVID-19 crosses borders with alarming speed. It hits Asia and then spreads out across the world. Hoping to contain the virus, airlines suspend flights to and from affected Chinese cities. Singapore rushes to evacuate its people from the worst hit city, Wuhan. 8th of February. Sohib Sajid's family have seats on the second and last evacuation flight back to Singapore. They're just at the toll plaza, so there's a lot of checking and procedures that need to follow. Children getting ready for a long journey ahead. They're on an eight-hour dash from the outskirts of Hubei province to Wuhan's international airport. With commercial flights suspended, this chartered plane is their only way home. It has been freakish two, three hours in a queue to pass the quarantine, immigration. Uh, it was a long journey from Hanshi to Wan. And what you see in front of me is my plane back home. Sohib's family are among 266 from Singapore evacuated from Wuhan on two charter flights. He feels compelled to document their journey on YouTube. I'm a YouTube fan and the, the circumstances are so unique. And not a lot of people might know like how it is to like come up from the lockdown area. When this kind of situation happens, people sometimes misuse the information or the news, right? So what I had on my phone was actually something what, that was real and documented. So finally, we are back home. Our plane has started taxi towards the runway. Sama, do you have anything to say? We are going home. Yeah. Mama, Atiya, Gambe! Gambe! So Hib's family goes into 14 days of quarantine. After seeing his experience online, the gravity of COVID-19 becomes clear to his social media followers. And some of friends will message me that it's quite worse than what we were thinking. And we have an update for you from here in Singapore. Singapore has confirmed its first cases of local transmission of the novel coronavirus. The latest cases include a six-month-old infant. We have stepped up our risk assessment from Doscon Yellow to Doscon Orange. Doscon Orange is Singapore's second highest level of alert for a disease outbreak. It's only been activated once before in 2009, during the swine flu pandemic. The alert announcement triggers panic buying. Irana, Irana. Social media posts fan the flames of fear, and it fuels more stockpiling. But Singapore isn't alone. Unfounded rumors swirl on social media of a looming global shortage of toilet paper because the world's top exporter, China, is under lockdown. Toilet paper aisle? Absolutely none left. Coles, toilet paper and tissue aisle, nothing left. Again. Apart from toilet paper, shoppers snap up hand sanitizers and grocery items, such as rice, instant noodles and fresh produce. <laughs> Face masks are in high demand. And in South Korea, scenes of long queues to buy them go viral, prompting even more people to queue up just to stock up. Hey, 
為銅鑼灣某間藥房賣千百蚊五十個口罩已經覺得好貴啦。但係頭先嗰間仲貴，一百八十蚊先得三個口罩，真係好貴咯。The internet quickly becomes a black market for face masks. Some are sold on e-commerce platforms, others over social media. It becomes difficult to tell which sellers are genuine. In Singapore, nearly a thousand buyers fall prey to scammers, losing more than $400,000 in total. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long addresses the nation in a call for calm. But fear can do more harm than the virus itself. It can make us panic or do things which make matters worse. Like circulating rumours online, hoarding face masks or food, or blaming particular groups for the outbreak. Instead, we should take courage and see through this stressful time together. Panic buying in Singapore eases off the next day. In Hong Kong, infections spread from the mainland. Rising fears of the virus rip through the social fabric, and much of it plays out online. A Facebook post by a caterer says they will serve Hong Kongers but not mainland Chinese. Another blog features a restaurant sign declaring, mainlanders will not be served. We just want to live longer and protect local patrons. Yang Yuli is a journalist from Wuhan, but she is based in Hong Kong. Certain people in Hong Kong discriminate against mainland Chinese people. I start to realize that it's probably best if I don't speak Mandarin when I'm um, walking around on the street. Yuli takes to social media in a call for unity against the virus. She starts sharing stories of childhood memories and famous people from Wuhan. I was hoping that by telling people what I love about Wuhan, it could contribute to bridging that gap between Wuhan and the rest of the world. If you know a little bit more about another person, it just makes it a little bit harder to hate them. Her post attracts tens of thousands of interactions on Facebook and Twitter, and it popularizes the tagline, Go Wuhan. But infection rates are still high and Yuli's family remain at risk. With a growing following online, she calls on netizens worldwide to send her messages of well wishes to the people of Wuhan. Yuli and friends translate the messages into Chinese and repost them on Chinese microblogging site Weibo. Her microblog is viewed over three million times. There is a real impact that these messages of love and compassion can have on, on them, to know that you are not alone, to know that you are supported, that give us a chance of fighting back this virus and potentially win. But Yuli's efforts cannot stop the wave of xenophobia building up worldwide. As the virus leaps across borders, so does hate. According to one estimate, the virus outbreak has caused a 900% uptick in hate speech on Twitter, with Chinese and Asians blamed for spreading COVID-19. They created this These Chinese people are crazy. In the US, even Asian Americans like Sarah Jun aren't spared. Why, why did somebody message me telling me to tell my people to stop eating wild animals? My people? Who, what do you mean, my people? Not allowing Chinese to stay or Asian to stay here? This post shows a member of hotel staff in the American state of Indiana. So no Asians can stay here? He's being filmed turning someone away for being Asian. Why is that? 
because of virus. So no Asians can stay either. Okay. Okay, we'll leave it. I'm from Singapore, and it's a small island nation in Southeast Asia, and not China, as I've had to explain to some of my American friends. Ao Yong Wai Kit is a literature teacher from Singapore. He's seen here at this 2014 forum in London, speaking about the politics of race. So, based on the official categories, first introduced by the British colonial government... He believes social media enables people to amplify their prejudices. We're facing a serious threat, like never before. Uh, not just of the virus, but of paranoia and xenophobia. Death to communism! In some ways, the paranoia and the xenophobia can be even more pervasive and even more perilous as compared to the virus itself. Why Kit decides to use social media as a force for good? His weapon of choice? Literature. We scramble for masks. He composes this poem, Gone Viral, in what is known as the twin cinema format. Masks reveal our fears. It features two columns that can be read individually to reveal two contrasting views. On the left... Some warn, how can we avoid foreign disease-ridden walking pathogens with their nauseating habits? We can hardly quarantine them all. And on the right... Media sources that paint visitors and immigrants as virus spreaders, xenophobes are plagues of terror. Read horizontally across, yet another meaning emerges. Xenophobes are walking pathogens, plagues of terror. With their nauseating habits, they mask their true intentions. We can hardly quarantine them all. Why Kit shares it on Facebook, hoping to spread the message beyond classrooms. His poem finds resonance across many borders. I received numerous emails and messages from students and educators around the world. When you have people sharing other people's shares, that's when we can see the viral nature of information dissemination through social media. That is an incredibly powerful feature of social media. And it's something that we need to harness for the greater good. But even as some harness the power of social media for good, the sea of online misinformation grows as COVID-19 finds one new epicenter after another. Europe wakes up to a surge of infections. March 2020. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Italy is the first country in Europe to overtake China in confirmed cases of infection. Nearly three weeks before that, the Italian government tries to stem the infections by imposing a nationwide quarantine. But it was met with defiance. Political leaders take to social media to reprimand them. The mayor of the port city of Bari in southern Italy goes on a patrol himself to get people off the streets. He posts the videos on Facebook, hoping the online shaming works as a deterrent. <laughs> The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced. Nearly two months after the first cases were detected in the UK, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson finally announces a lockdown on the 23rd of March. The delay escalates infections nationwide. You must stay at home, because the critical thing we must do to stop the disease spreading between households. 
The message is screened on TV and streamed on social media for maximum reach. The way ahead is hard, and it is still true that many lives will sadly be lost. Hi, folks, I want to bring you up to speed. Just three days later, a shocking turn of events. I've taken a test that has come out positive. In self-isolation, the UK Prime Minister puts up a brave front online. His tweets show him in control and chairing meetings remotely. Then came his tweet that he has gone to hospital and a government confirmation that same night that he is in intensive care. The sudden turn of events stuns the nation, leading to speculation online as well as in the media about the Prime Minister's actual condition. As his Twitter feed goes silent, Britons wait with bated breath for a week before he reappeared to post about his recovery. Good afternoon. I've today left hospital after a week in which the NHS has saved my life. No question. In late March, most of Europe closes its borders to non-citizens and impose tight restrictions on internal travel. Google Earth images show what the Vatican usually looks like, teeming with visitors. The Vatican now falls silent. And the nightmare is only just beginning in the United States. After an initial shortage of test kits, America remains slow to carry out widespread testing. Infections skyrocket, medical supplies dwindle, and hospitals buckle under pressure. Hi, I'm Kelly. I am an ICU nurse in Manhattan. We are reusing what is meant to be one-time use only personal protective equipment. That includes um, N95 masks, surgical masks, gowns, and face shields. We look around and Frustratingly, we still see large groups of people continuing to gather, ignoring medical advice and acting like this is no big deal. The governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, amplifies Kelly's appeal by sharing it on social media. The governor's tweet sends more than 200,000 pairs of eyeballs to Kelly's post, but it's drowned out by unreliable information that spreads far and wide on social media. In Iran, hundreds of adults and children die from methanol poisoning after they fall for a fake remedy on social media. In Indonesia, the World Health Organization warns against believing viral Facebook posts that suggest smoking prevents COVID-19. In South Korea, a church official sprays salt water into the mouths of churchgoers, duped by misinformation that it prevents the virus. A total of 46 followers are infected. In a world desperate for a cure, US President Donald Trump tweets that an unproven drug cocktail could treat the virus. It attracts more than half a million interactions. So chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Now this is a common malaria drug and it's shown very encouraging, very, very encouraging early results. I think it's going to be great. These claims are unfounded. Is that what you're doing? And even the US government's top immunologist urges caution. But misinformation respects no borders. Trump's endorsement has far-reaching consequences. In Nigeria, a health official tweets that hospitals across Lagos are seeing patients suffering from chronic chloroquine poisoning. It's 
If you are new to this channel, my name is Mickey Rye and I am a registered nurse. A nurse in California is using social media to counter the growing tide of medical misinformation. There's so much misinformation out there, and especially when it's coming from celebrities or people who are verified. And when you recommend things, people buy them, people seek out those products. And so it's really important to be careful and conscious with your influence. Most of Mickey Rye's online followers are teenagers and young adults. She uses accessible language to drive home the message of care and caution. There's also people who are saying like, oh, these dances are stupid. Why are you doing this? But again, I think if the content is able to even educate one person, then it would have been a win in my book. Owen Sweeney is an expert on verifying online content. Based in Berlin, he trains journalists worldwide on fact checking. He believes the flood of social media about this pandemic has made it bewildering for journalists trying to verify the facts. It's like the old whack-a-mole game where things are popping up and as soon as you hammer one down, another one pops up elsewhere. Some people stand to make money by either selling you products or services. By being sensationalist, they can get lots of hits on their YouTube channel, monetize that, get clicks for ads. And then other things are, of course, political and ideological motivations. And there are people then who are just doing it for kicks. They get a, get a bit of a amusement or excitement out of watching the in disinformation that they've created spreading around. But in the battle for the world's attention, online misinformation is about to face an unprecedented groundswell of social media movements. As COVID-19 spreads around the world, because the virus, the information explosion on social media creates an infodemic. This is when unreliable online content is spread far and wide, often causing serious harm. Big tech companies react by forming an unprecedented alliance with health authorities to battle misinformation. Anyone searching for key words relating to the virus will see a prominent banner directing them to official sources, ensuring that reliable information is never more than a click away. Clean your hands. Inspect it for tears or holes. To make reliable information more accessible, health authorities and international agencies go beyond the usual press statements. On TikTok, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent, WHO and UNICEF use cute cartoons and simple dances to stress the importance of basic hygiene. Working with the Vietnamese government, Vietnamese artist Quan Dang uses a catchy tune to show how good hand hygiene keeps the virus away. It becomes a worldwide dance craze across social media. Hashtags also become powerful tools in galvanizing these viral movements. Celebrities use hashtags on their posts to help spread important messages. The hashtag stay at home challenge is spearheaded by famous footballers, reminding their fans to stay at home. 
In Singapore, hashtags inspire kindness for discriminated frontline health workers. We started Braveheart SG because we were reading in the news people, some people were bullying nurses. Wally Tam heads a group that creates campaigns to get Singaporeans to be more gracious to each other. He takes action after seeing posts on social media about public transport commuters accusing nurses of spreading the virus. Some nurses were told off for taking public buses and trains. So what we did was to uh, create a hashtag and invite people to write uh, notes of encouragement to the COVID frontliners. We didn't expect over 6,000 submissions through social media. It was quite beautiful, actually. Uh, there were kids who were drawing nurses and doctors and calling them heroes. The team prints out the messages and distributes them at hospitals and polyclinics. Thank you. It was so touching. At least somebody appreciated us. Thank you so much, Singaporean. The past three days I was sharing with my colleagues. I am even being given a seat in the train. And I'm in uniform. Hashtag Braveheart SG go on to inspire similar campaigns around the world. More hashtags celebrating the heroic efforts of healthcare workers also go viral. The CLAP campaigns help counter any discrimination medical workers might face. Wuhan-born journalist Yang Yuli started the hashtag Go Wuhan campaign. She now changes it to hashtag Go Wuhan, Go World. With China seemingly on the mend, she collects messages of support from Wuhan and translates them into English for the world to see. We realize that people in Wuhan have um, potentially a lot of tips and advices that they could potentially share um, for the rest of the world. These um, experiences could be helpful for the rest of the world, and it is time kind of for Wuhan to make its own contribution to this global fight against the virus. In April, China finally lifts its restrictions and Chinese social media is awash with scenes of hope and homecoming. <laughs> In neighboring Anhui province, it's time for Wei Chanson to go home to his family. For two months, He's been on checkpoint duty to enforce travel restrictions in the village. Hey, Wow. 
Meanwhile, over in Wuhan, recovered patient Wan Chun Wei has joined the fight against this virus. Chinese health authorities believe antibodies in the blood of recovered patients might provide the best short-term treatment for severe cases. It was a method used to combat the Ebola virus and SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Using his social media reach, Wan makes a call out to other recovered patients. The battle to save lives from COVID-19 is far from over. But it's a war fought on two fronts. The real world and cyberspace. Developing a vaccine defends us against the virus. But there's no antidote for the online tinderbox of misinformation. It ignites fear and confusion in the physical world. Mitigated only when all of us harness the power of social media as a force for good.